Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Deep Dive Podcast. I'm Sophia, joined by my amazing co-host, Ethan. Hey, everyone. We're so glad to have you with us for another exciting episode. Today, we've got a mind-blowing topic to discuss. But first, Sophia, I have to ask, would you ever want to take a vacation to the Red Planet? Hmm, a vacation to Mars? It sounds incredible, but also a little terrifying. I mean, it's not exactly a weekend getaway. What about you, Ethan? Honestly, I'm intrigued. The idea of walking on a different planet sounds surreal, but I'd need some serious convincing. And speaking of Mars, today's episode dives into Elon Musk's latest proposal to rename Mars as New World and his vision of establishing a self-sustaining human settlement there for humanity's long-term survival. That's right. Musk's idea has sparked a lot of debate, renaming Mars, creating a colony, and ensuring the survival of humanity. It's a fascinating topic, and we're going to, to break it all down for you. So buckle up, everyone. But before we launch into this episode, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and like this video. It helps us keep exploring these big ideas and sharing them with you. And while you're at it, drop a comment below. Would you pack your bags for the red planet, or should we leave Mars as it is? Let's dive in. All right, so today we're going to be uh, taking a deep dive into all things Elon Musk and Mars. You've sent us tons of articles and even some scientific papers all about it. We're talking Economic Times, Times of India, NEWS.am, all sorts of stuff. Yeah, it seems like Mars is on everyone's mind these days. Yeah. Especially with Musk making those bold statements about colonizing it. Well, that's exactly what we're going to be talking about today. We'll be cutting through the hype to see how feasible this whole thing really is. Mm -hmm. So what are the real opportunities and the real obstacles? You know, when you look at all the sources, it seems like everyone has a different opinion on whether Musk can actually pull this off. What we'll try to do is uh, go through all of that and give you a breakdown of what's really going on. Exactly. Is this just a billionaire's fantasy or could we really become a multi-planetary species? I mean, it's a pretty wild idea when you think about it. It really is. And one thing that really stood out to me when I was reading through everything was this idea that Musk wants to rename Mars New World. Yeah, I saw that too. What do you think about that? I mean, it's bull for sure feels very like Age of Exploration, you know, evokes those historical parallels. But I think it also goes deeper than that. How so? Well, if Mars is the New World, then Earth becomes the Old World. Oh, I see what you mean. It's like he's creating a dichotomy. Exactly. And it frames this whole thing as not just a scientific endeavor, but almost a cultural shift. That's a really interesting point. It's like he's trying to change the way we think about humanity's place in the cosmos. But it makes me wonder why Mars... Right. <laughs> why not focus on fixing things here on Earth first? That's the big question a lot of experts are asking. Yeah, I saw Neil deGrasse Tyson even weighed in on this. Yeah, he's been pretty vocal about it. He thinks the resources would be better spent on tackling climate change. But Musk has a pretty interesting counter-argument. Oh, really? What's that? He basically sees Earth as fragile, like we're living on borrowed time. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So for him, Mars isn't just about expansion. It's about ensuring the survival of consciousness itself. Wow. That's pretty deep. So it's almost an existential mission for him, like a backup plan for humanity. Right. And that's a theme that comes up a lot in his talks and interviews. He really believes that becoming a multi-planetary species is essential for our long-term survival. Okay, I can see where he's coming from, but even if that's the goal, how does he actually plan to get a million people to Mars? Especially by the 2030s, that timeline seems crazy ambitious. Yeah, it's definitely a tight schedule, but that's where SpaceX's Starship comes in. Ah, yes, the Starship. I've heard a lot about this. It's basically the cornerstone of his Mars strategy. So what's so special about it? Well, for one thing, it's designed to be fully reusable, which is a game changer in terms of cost. Imagine a spacecraft that can carry 100 passengers and tons of cargo, make the trip to Mars, and then fly back for another round. So like a space shuttle, but on an interplanetary scale. Exactly. And from what I've read, they're not just designing it. They're actually building and testing it as we speak. Yeah. Some of the sources you sent mentioned five unmanned missions planned for the next two years. Right. Those missions are going to be crucial. They'll be delivering the essentials water, oxygen, fuel, and equipment to start building infrastructure. So it's like the advance party setting up camp before the settlers arrive. Exactly. They're laying the groundwork for that first human landing. Which makes sense, considering how long it takes to get to Mars. We're talking months of travel time. Exactly. It's not a quick trip. And once they get there, they're facing some seriously tough challenges. Mars isn't exactly a welcoming environment. Yeah, that's an understatement. <clears throat> Thin atmosphere, cosmic radiation... 
massive dust storms, freezing temperatures. It's like the ultimate survival test. It really is. And your sources go into a lot of detail about how SpaceX plans to tackle those challenges. Well, let's dive into that then. I'm curious to hear what they've come up with. All right, so let's start with radiation. You can't just build a regular house on Mars. You need something that can shield you from those harmful cosmic rays. Right, otherwise you'd be exposed to all sorts of nasty stuff. Yeah. Exactly. So SpaceX is proposing specially designed habitats, almost like dome-shaped bunkers made with radiation-blocking materials. Okay, that makes sense. But what about those infamous Martian dust storms? I remember seeing pictures from the rovers where the whole sky turns red. Yeah, those are no joke. They can last for weeks and cover the entire planet. So they're looking at using advanced filtration systems in their habitats, essentially creating safe, breathable environments, even when the outside world is choked with dust. Smart, because you definitely don't want your life support systems clogged with Martian dust. But speaking of life support, what about breathing? The Martian atmosphere is mostly carbon dioxide, right? Right, you can't just breathe the air on Mars. You need to bring your own oxygen or find a way to generate it there. And it sounds like they have a plan for that. They do, it's actually pretty <laughs> fascinating. They're looking at scaling up technology from the MOXI experiment on the Perseverance rover. That experiment has already successfully generated oxygen from the Martian atmosphere. Wow, so it's like a proof of concept that they could actually make breathable air on Mars? Yeah. Exactly. It's a pretty big deal. That's amazing. It seems like they're pulling ideas from all these different sources and pushing the boundaries of technology. But even if you can breathe, you still need food and water to survive. You can't exactly pop down to the supermarket on Mars. No grocery deliveries on Mars, at least not yet. So their solution is hydroponics, essentially growing crops indoors using water and nutrients without soil. So picture high-tech greenhouses bathed in artificial light, growing all sorts of food sounds futuristic. Exactly. And they might even genetically modify plants to thrive in Martian conditions. That's really cool. But where are they getting the water? Mars isn't exactly known for its lush rivers and lakes. That's true. But there's evidence of water ice beneath the surface. SpaceX plans to extract and purify this ice, providing water for drinking agriculture and even fuel. So it's all about resourcefulness and self-sufficiency. But we've talked a lot about the environment and the technology. What about the human factor? Can our bodies even handle living on a planet with just 38% of Earth's gravity? That's a great question, and one that scientists are still trying to fully understand. We know from studying astronauts on the International Space Station that prolonged exposure to low gravity can lead to bone loss, muscle atrophy, and cardiovascular issues. Yeah, I've heard about that. It's like our bodies are fine-tuned for Earth's gravity and going to Mars could throw everything off. Exactly. So SpaceX is planning countermeasures, things like intense exercise regimens using specialized equipment. They're even considering artificial gravity systems, almost like a giant spinning structure to simulate Earth's gravity. Like a Martian gym on steroids. But it's not just about the physical challenges, right? Imagine the psychological impact of living in a confined environment millions of miles from Earth with the same small group of people for years. Yeah, the isolation, the confinement, what they call the Earth out of view phenomenon, it's a huge concern. SpaceX is exploring everything from careful crew selection to psychological support programs, even using virtual reality and augmented reality to create immersive experiences and help colonists stay connected to Earth. So it's like having a virtual window back home Exactly. But there's another layer to this human element, governance. Who's in charge on Mars? How do you create a functioning society in such a unique and challenging environment? Yeah, that's a great question. It's almost like building a new civilization from scratch. What kind of government would work on Mars? Well, it's likely to be a combination of things. In the early stages, you'd probably need a semi-military command structure to ensure order and efficiency, mm. especially during those critical first years. But as the colony matures, you could see more democratic systems emerging, possibly even a direct democracy where every colonist has a voice. And given the distance from Earth, the communication delays the unique challenges of Mars. Could those colonies eventually seek independence? It's a fascinating possibility. But before we get too far ahead of ourselves, let's talk money. All of this is the starships, the habitats, the life support systems. It's going to cost a fortune. Right. And currently SpaceX is funding most of it. Can they really fit the bill for a full-scale Mars colonization project? Well, they'd certainly need more investment from both governments and private companies. It would have to be a global effort, a true collaboration to make this vision a reality. It's a huge undertaking, no doubt about it. But 
buried in all these sources, there are some really intriguing details that I think we should unpack. Oh, I'm all ears. What caught your attention? Well, there's this study about chloride-rich depressions on Mars, which apparently suggests that there were once repeated cycles of wetting and drying on the surface. Ah, yes. The research from the Physical Research Laboratory in Ahmedabad. It's fascinating because it lends credence to the idea that Mars might have once been habitable possibly even harboring life. It's like a Martian fossil record hinting at a more watery past. <laughs> and then there's the cost comparison Musk made. He said a round trip to Mars could eventually cost around $100,000, roughly the same as the median house price in California. Yeah, that's quite a provocative statement. He's implying that going to Mars could become relatively affordable, at least compared to some things here on Earth. Yeah. But would you be willing to leave everything behind and take that one-way ticket to the new world? That's a huge question and one we should definitely explore in our next segment. This is where it gets really interesting because we're not just talking about the logistics anymore. We're talking about the human choices and what they mean for the future of our species. Yeah, it really does make you think, what would a Martian society actually look like? How would people live? How would they govern themselves? It's hard to even imagine, you know, like, would they have elections? Would they have a president or a prime minister? Or a king, even. Right. Would it be like a monarchy or a democracy or something completely different? Well, some of your sources actually touched on this. They talked about how research stations in Antarctica and the Arctic could be seen as analogs for Martian settlements. Oh, that's interesting. I see what you mean. Those are places where people live and work in really extreme conditions, isolated from the rest of the world, and they have to cooperate and be really resourceful to survive. Exactly. They're like little microcosms of what a Martian society might face. And it's not just about physical survival either, right? Mm -hmm. There's the psychological aspect of being confined with the same group of people for months or even years on end. Oh, absolutely. You'd have to be really careful about who you choose to go to Mars with. I mean, imagine being stuck in a tiny habitat with someone who you just can't stand. Oh, gosh. Yeah, that would be a nightmare. And think about how social norms and behaviors might evolve on Mars. Yeah, like would they develop their own unique culture, their own traditions? Would they even still consider themselves Earthlings or would they see themselves as Martians? Whoa, that's trippy. It's like we're talking about the birth of a whole new civilization. But it makes me wonder about the kids who might be born on Mars. Would they be able to come back to Earth, visit their grandparents? Well, that raises a really important question about human development in low gravity. If you grew up on Mars with just 38% of Earth's gravity, how would your body adapt to Earth's gravity? Would you even be able to walk or would you be like a fish out of water? It's like that movie John Carter, right? Kind of, but even more extreme because we're talking about long-term exposure from birth. And what about their sense of identity? If you've never breathed fresh air or felt the wind on your skin, would you even feel like you belong on Earth? It makes you realize how much of who we are is shaped by our environment. It really does. And it also brings up some big ethical questions like, do we have the right to impose our values and our way of life on a potential Martian civilization? Yeah, that's a whole other can of worms. And then there's the big unknown. What if we discover life on Mars? What happens then? Whoa, yeah. I remember reading about that in one of the articles. They talked about those chloride-rich depressions that suggest there was once water on the surface. Right, and that raises the possibility that microbial life might have existed on Mars at some point. It's in a Martian fossil record. <laughs> <laughs> but if we find evidence of current life, even tiny bacteria that changes everything. It would mean we're not alone in the universe. And it would also raise a lot of questions about how we interact with that life. Like, would colonizing Mars threaten those Martian ecosystems? It's a delicate balance, for sure. And it's something that Musk and SpaceX have said they're taking very seriously. So it seems like, even though Musk is this big visionary, there are still a lot of unknowns and potential risks. Oh, absolutely. This isn't just a walk in the park. We're talking about a completely uncharted territory, both literally and figuratively. Right. And some of the sources you sent were pretty critical of Musk's approach. They argued that we should be focusing on fixing our problems here on Earth first before we go off colonizing other planets. Yeah, that's a common criticism, and it's understandable. We've got climate change, poverty, inequality. We've got a lot of work to do here. And some people worry that going to Mars is just a way for the wealthy elite to escape Earth's problems, like a billionaire's lifeboat. Right, and they also question the ethical implications of colonization. Like, who gets to decide who goes to Mars, who gets to benefit from its resources? Yeah, those are all valid concerns. It's almost like this whole conversation is forcing us to re-examine our values and priorities. 
I think you're right. It's not just about the science and the technology. It's about what kind of future we want to build for humanity. So are we going to be a species that prioritizes exploration and expansion, or are we going to focus on taking care of our own planet and each other? It's a tough question, and I don't think there's an easy answer. But it's a question we have to ask ourselves because the choices we make today will have consequences for generations to come. And speaking of the future, let's go back to Musk's idea of Mars as a refuge for humanity like a backup plan in case something catastrophic happens on Earth. Right, like a giant planetary lifeboat. But is it even realistic? Well, it depends on the scale of the catastrophe. If we're talking about a global nuclear war or a giant asteroid impact, then even Mars might not be safe. And even if it is, who gets to go, who gets left behind? Those are some heavy questions, and they raise some uncomfortable truths about human nature. Would we be able to come together as a species in the face of a global threat? Or would we descend into chaos and infighting? It's a scary thought, and it makes you wonder if Mars would really be a symbol of unity or just another stage for human division and conflict. It's a lot to contemplate. And as we move into our final segment, it's clear that Musk's Mars vision is a Pandora's box of complex and challenging questions. Questions that will shape the future of humanity, whether or not we ever set foot on Martian soil. Okay, so we've talked about the technology, the challenges, the ethics, uh, even the potential for life on Mars. But after going through all these sources, I keep coming back to the same question. Is Musk's vision actually achievable? It's the question, isn't it? And I don't think anyone has a definitive answer right now. Even Musk himself says it's a long shot. I mean, this isn't like going to the moon. We're talking about terraforming an entire planet. It's a pretty wild idea when you really think about it. But then again, 10 years ago, reusable rockets were considered science fiction. And now look. You're right, the technology is advancing at an incredible pace. And there's definitely a lot of momentum behind this whole Mars thing. So you think it's at least possible? I think it's definitely within the realm of possibility. But even if the technology works out, there's still the human factor. Right. Can we actually handle living on Mars both physically and mentally? That's the big unknown. And honestly, it might be the biggest challenge of all. You know, it makes me think about those early explorers who sailed across the oceans. They faced incredible dangers and hardships, but they were driven by this thirst for discovery. And that same spirit seems to be driving Musk. It's not just about colonizing another planet. It's about pushing the boundaries of what's possible. And even if we don't see a million people living on Mars in our lifetime, just the pursuit of that goal could lead to amazing breakthroughs. Absolutely. Think about the spinoffs. The technologies we develop for Mars could have huge implications for solving problems here on Earth. Like closed-loop life support systems or advanced materials or new energy sources. Exactly. And beyond the technology, there's the inspiration factor. Imagine the impact on future generations seeing humans living on another planet. It's like a giant leap for all of humanity. And it could spark a whole new wave of scientific discovery and innovation. But it also makes you wonder what kind of world we'd be leaving for them. Right. Would a Martian society be a utopia or would it repeat the same mistakes we've made on Earth? It's a question we can't answer, but it's a question worth thinking about. This whole deep dive is really just scratched the surface. We've explored so many facets of this, but there's still so much more to uncover. And that's where you come in, our listeners. We've given you the information. Now it's up to you to dig deeper ask questions, form your own opinions. Would you want to live on Mars? What kind of society would you create? What would you be willing to sacrifice? These are big questions and they don't have easy answers. But that's what makes this topic so fascinating. It forces us to confront the really big questions. About what it means to be human, our place in the universe, and the future we want to create. And whether or not we ever set foot on Mars, that journey of exploration is what truly matters. And that's a wrap for today's episode of Deep Dive Podcast. We hope you enjoyed exploring Elon Musk's vision of renaming Mars as New World and building a self-sustaining human settlement. It's wild to think about humanity living on another planet, isn't it? Thanks so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe before you start planning your trip to Mars. And give this video a thumbs up. It helps us a lot. Also, let us know in the comments what you think about Musk's idea. Is it brilliant or is it just too ambitious? Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time for another deep dive into the fascinating and unexpected. Until then, stay curious and take care. Bye for now.